everyone. Thanks so much for joining us today for this webinar on Our Power, uh, which is the report of offshore workers' demands for a just energy transition. We've got a couple of great speakers for you today. So we've got Rosemary Harris and we've got Murray Church. Rosemary's worked a platform on a just transition for the North Sea for two years with a specialism in political strategy and advocacy and is a co-author of the Our Power Report. Murray is Head of Campaigns at Friends of the Earth Scotland and helped found the Just Transition Partnership, a strategic alliance between trade unions and environmentalists in Scotland. So I'm gonna pass over to them now. Uh, we're gonna do a fairly fast session um, and then we're gonna move into plenty of time for questions and answers. Um, so yeah, over to you, Murray. Thank you both. Um... So I'm going to speak very briefly about some of the background to this work, so where it's come from and how it's been possible to do what is, you know, possibly, and we'd love to hear if it's not, um, a world first, actually, at least in the global north, in terms of this really deep collaboration between environmentalists and oil and gas or any kind of fossil fuel workers in co-creating an agenda for just transition. Um, so for us in Friends of the Air Scotland, I think, a good point to start off with in terms of the you know the story of where this has come from is the founding of the just transition partnership in 2016 which as shona said um is a strategic alliance between friends of scotland and the scottish trade union congress and it has a wider membership including a number of affiliate uh, trade unions and the partnership really focuses on what our common ground is and and that is about the way that we meet our climate obligations must be done in a way that ensures no worker or community is left behind. So really learning the lessons of some of the really badly done energy transitions of the past. Uh, and it's the work of the partnership and enabled by the partnership that has really put Just Transition at the centre of the decarbonisation narrative, at least in Scotland. In the last six years since we formed, we've won a Just Transition Commission, which is now in its second iteration and really starting to hold the Scottish Government to account. We've got commitments to, from the Scottish Government to Just Transition plans for sectors and regions. We've got a Just Transition Minister and, like really importantly, we've got Just Transition principles in law. And we might not, we're not, we are not yet seeing these wins, like actually realise a Just Transition on the ground but we do have this legislative and policy framework that requires it and therefore the means of holding the Scottish Government to account. And obviously that's very Scottish sort of centred, what I've just said, but it also provides a model for those who are campaigning for a just transition in the rest of the UK um, and further afield uh, to point to. And this, the, the partnership really has also been a space that has enabled trust to take root between our movements. And from this, we've seen all kinds of things, including, I would argue, this work um, at, at, that we're presenting today. We, we, this work has grown from that. And so have all the fantastic sort of demonstrations of, of solidarity and unity between trade unions, workers, and uh, the environment movement. So I'm thinking specifically of some of the fantastic displays of, of, of solidarity that we saw at COP26 and subsequently on many of the picket lines. And I think it's this, like having a better and deeper understanding of the experience and priorities of trade unions and workers has really enabled us as environmentalists to reflect their demands in our work on phasing out fossil fuels. And the Our Power report is part of a series uh, of reports that Friends of Scotland and Platform have published together, along with other allies, looking at this phase out agenda and how to do that by way of a just transition. So we had the sea change report was the first of these that was in 2019. And that built on previous work by Oil Change International to show that to avoid uh, breaching the, the, the really critical 1.5 degree threshold, there could be no new oil and gas licenses. And in fact, some of the UK licenses would need to be phased out ahead of their economic life. It also showed that with the right policies in place, three jobs could be created for every oil and gas job at risk from a Paris aligned um, phase out. And in 2001, we conducted a survey of over 1000 offshore workers. And the findings of that survey showed really how few offshore workers. So despite all these um, 
uh, commitments from Scottish government and, and you know, legislative and, and, and policy gains on that front. Despite that, something like 91% of, um, of workers that we surveyed hadn't even heard of the term just transition, but, and they were also open to leaving the offshore industry for work in renewables, if only it was there. And we also found out more about the impact of, you know, for example, the erosion of pay and conditions, how that was having, what, how that was impacting on the livelihoods and morale of offshore workers. And it was this work that gave rise to the campaigning that we've been doing together with Platform on the offshore training passports to align standards between the offshore oil and gas industry training requirements and those of the offshore renewable industry training requirements to end what is effectively uh, training industry racketeering and the heavy costs that were being left um, to workers to shoulder to, to, to make those, those moves. And I think it's also this, this work, all of this work that I've just talked about that has, has really given us the confidence to take this next step and kick off this much deeper process of organizing with offshore workers, uh, which has resulted in this co-creation of the 10 demands that you see in the Our Power report. So I'm gonna stop there and hand over to Rosemary, who is gonna talk more about the process behind the report and the demands themselves. Sorry, just struggling to unmute myself there. Uh, thanks, Mary. Um, so before I go into kind of talking about the process that we went through and some of the things that we found out, I think it's important to maybe base it in the, the principles that we sort of decided on at the very beginning of uh, the work that we were doing uh, in a strangely sunny day in Glasgow, actually, uh, about two years ago. Um, so the basis of, of the report and kind of that sits within the context that um, Mary laid out is that we need to phase out fossil fuels rapidly to keep within our fair share of 1.5 degrees and that but that any transition that allows for that needs to be planned by the workers and communities that are going to be most impacted um, but then within that while we knew that this work sat in the context of phase out it was really important to us that we never tried to put those words and conversations about phase out in the mouths of workers who hadn't said that and weren't calling for it and it, for us it was really important to be able to separate our political and ideological background of, of believing in phase out and what the workers needed and wanted without needing the workers themselves to be calling for phase out which would obviously be ideal but it just isn't wasn't the reality of where we are or where we were at the time um, and then a lot of it was then kind of just based in how we wanted to approach it in conversations with the workers so we wanted to respect the privacy dignity and autonomy of the people and groups that we're working with as far as possible it's about being as non-extractive as possible but with the recognition that it's difficult it's almost impossible to be entirely non-extractive so to just recognize that in the work that we're doing we wanted the conversations and discussions with workers to be led and shaped as far as possible by them so we came in with an idea of where we thought conversations might go and the kind of information we were looking for but also without trying to put our preconceptions into how we thought workshops or conversations or phone calls might go and then finally something that was important and difficult was the the diversity of experiences values and political ideology is a really important part of the work and is an important part of this kind of organizing but we committed to holding red lines on issues of racism, sexism, and other discriminatory attitudes. Um, that's something that luckily we actually didn't face too much of, but there were things that we put in place that made sure that we were able to handle those things while like ho holding the space and not making people feel like they couldn't be there, but also not letting things go that were unacceptable. Part of that was making sure that we had really experienced facilitators doing the workshops so it wasn't us um, who were actually running the workshops ourselves um, and I'll explain a bit more about that in the process so having spent sort of two or two ish two three years doing the, the offshore report running campaigns around training for workers um, 
spending a lot of time going up to Aberdeen and back from Aberdeen, spending more time on trains than we did in Aberdeen. Um, we felt ready to organize workshops, having kind of built those relationships with workers. So we organized six workshops across Newcastle, Edinburgh and Aberdeen, um, which is kind of more about where oil and gas workers tend to be um, than anything else. Uh, we had 34 people attend those workshops. Um, and on the slide, you'll see there's just a bit of information about kind of the the sort of variety of people we had. We wanted to have participants who were quite new to being offshore or hadn't or had been there their whole lives or had retired. Um, some had just left being offshore for various reasons. And then people working across like a whole range of departments because there are some jobs in offshore that are much easier to transition than others and it's important to kind of understand the concerns that different people have those workshops were, as we said were facilitated by two very experienced external facilitators who we worked with to kind of create the process and we were there to provide the context and answer questions but we tried to be as kind of hands off as possible so that we weren't dictating where the conversations went we left those workshops with a load of notes on flip charts, on laptops, on post-it notes, and spent a couple of days pulling out what we thought were the main themes and the main concerns and coming up with a draft list of 10 demands, which we then took back to the people who'd been to the workshops, talked to them about it over the phone and made any changes that, to make sure that they felt like what we'd come out with reflected what they'd actually said and what they actually needed rather than what we had maybe misunderstood or anything like that. So we then, when we'd finalized those and kind of discussed them with the workers, we sent them back out on a survey. So that was again to the wider workforce. It was over, over a thousand complete people completed the survey with 90% supporting the full set of demands. And we also wanted to understand if there were demands that people preferred over others. Um, so if they said they couldn't support the full set of demands, we gave them options to pick the ones that they did agree, which means that the whole set of demands has a 90% approval rating, but no, no individual demand has less than 90% and some have higher. Um, we've uh, got a couple of images again, just to show the kind of range. So 61% unionized, which is higher than the kind of total union, like the unionization rate offshore is significantly lower than that, but I, it, it kind of makes sense that the people that we're engaging with were on the whole more likely to be unionized. And then the kind of, ooh, the spread across the UK um, with a concentration in Scotland and the North of England. Um, also, Mary mentioned that in the offshore report, 9% of people who responded to the survey had heard of the just transition. And we asked that question again in this survey and it was up to 40%, which is not as high as we'd like it to be, but it's still quite a big change across two years. So we were really pleased to kind of see that some of that messaging and some of that kind of idea is sort of coming through the, through the workforce as it gets picked up more. So what did we come out with? I'm sure all of you have read end to end the 116 page report that we came out with. Um, but for those of you that haven't, this is uh, the spread of all the demands. They were split into three themes. So kind of addressing solutions for the immediate barriers that workers are facing to move into renewables, which is making sure that workers are at the center of transition planning, making sure that there are clear pathways out of high carbon jobs that are actually accessible, making sure that the training regime is actually fit for purpose and isn't just built to take profit um, off the workers and invest in domestic manufacturing and assembly for renewables. So actually making it so that the UK has the, has the infrastructure to use a lot of the fabrication yards and things like that to create offshore uh, kind of like jackets for offshore wind farms and things like that. We then had our rights which is about making sure that jobs in renewables, but also in oil and gas are secure, well-paid and safe. So restoring really strong collective bargaining with strong rank and file unions across the whole offshore industry. A lot of uh, 
companies that are moving into renewables aren't transferring across their collective bargaining, which means that sometimes jobs in renewables are actually less well paid than jobs in oil and gas and less secure. Establishing a universal rights and wage floor across the UK continental shelf. So there are loopholes for uh, particularly offshore renewables that mean that migrant workers can be paid well below the UK minimum wage for the same work. Um, and effective and trusted whistleblowing procedures. And then finally, our energy, which is looking at a new energy system where benefits are fared sharely and there's greater public control. So who owns it and who benefits from it? And that was actually something that came through really strongly in the workshops, um, which was interesting because the workers weren't using perhaps the language of public ownership, public energy, that uh, campaigners and, and perhaps is more associated with left wing campaigns, but the, the values and the ideas were still there. Um, so public ownership for public good, reorganizing the tax system for public goods, so addressing the kind of incredible profits that the oil and gas and energy companies are making and then no community left behind which really like places these demands back in the community and came through particularly strongly from a workshop that we had actually in Aberdeen where it was all workers from Aberdeen who'd grown up there and it was about like they'd seen money be made from Aberdeen and taken straight out of Aberdeen and they were watching the their kind of hometown be like slowly deteriorate as the oil and gas companies start to sort of take their money and run. Um, and it's about making sure that we don't repeat the mistakes of previous kind of industrial transitions across the UK that have not been planned well um, and would only generously be called transitions, I think. Um, so that's kind of just like a very quick rundown of the report. And there's a lot more information that you can find kind of online and we'll hopefully get into a little bit of it in, um, in the questions. But we wanted to kind of also quickly run over what happens next. Um, and with the caveat that I think both foes and platform are very much kind of still working that out a little bit. And part of this is to kind of get an understanding of what's resonating with people. But um, I will, so we're gonna do the UK and as a whole and Scotland and then we'll move into questions. So I, so what is next? Uh, kind of UK as a whole, and also we have a focus on England. So um, prior to the release of Our Power, Bose and Platform have been running a campaign in support of an offshore training passport for workers, which looks at making their skills more transferable as they move into renewables. Um, we've had kind of some success and we're waiting on a process that is going on between some of the training standards bodies at the moment and we'll continue to push on that um, as a kind of hopefully real tangible win for um, workers that will make a real difference to them immediately. Um, on a kind of longer term scale, uh, looking at looking towards kind of the next general election and some of the processes that Labour in particular are going through in setting up their policy platform, trying to kind of have some of the workers' demands and just transition ideas take kind of be part of that platform, whether it needs to be couched in the exact wording that we use, whether they're comfortable using the term just transition is like a very big, big conversation in itself, but there's some really concrete policy suggestions that are costed within the report they were hoping that we could kind of get into their um, into their manifesto and into kind of thinking how they understand an energy transition. Um, something that people who campaign in, in England on this call will probably be aware of is, and particularly, I guess, in contrast to some of the context that Mary was setting in Scotland, is that the conversation around just transition in England is really far behind. Um, it's not really a concept that the government or the opposition parties or really politically is being talked about. And it's not something that I think that is being campaigned on in, in a kind of coherent way, perhaps. Um, I think there's a lot of really amazing work that sits kind of is really within the idea of a just transition, but I'm not sure that we have a kind of understanding of it. So kind of trying to understand how we can embed that a bit more. Uh, and then also working with uh, local branches of trade unions and constituency branch parties, party branches to kind of further some of that work. So maybe 
looking at passing motions in local branches of trade unions that then maybe can go up to the TUC if possible. Um, and then there's the kind of looming spectre of a general election in the next kind of 18 to 20 months, I guess, um, which will change things and will provide lots of new opportunities. Uh, and we need to grapple with that uh, pretty soon, I think. Um, but yeah, that's a kind of quick, quick and dirty idea of what's next in the UK. We've also, as a very, very early thing, have a um, an event in Westminster on the 27th of March, where we're hoping to bring uh, the demands to a few MPs and take and some of the offshore workers will be there to kind of speak to the work that they've done to the people who maybe have the power to enact some of it. And I will now pass back to Mary. Thanks, Rosemary. Um, so yeah, I'm just going to say a few brief words about what next in terms of uh, Scotland, and then we'll move to the Q and A. So we're in the middle of um, the Scottish government's consultation process on the first of these government-led just transition plans, and it's arguably it's the big one, the energy strategy and just transition plan for the energy sector. And the ESJTP, as it's known by its shorthand, has been a really a very long time coming. Um, and there's been a considerable emphasis on pre-engagement and co-design by the Scottish government. Uh, and with many of our allies across the trade unions and the environment movement feeding into this, uh, this sort of pre-engagement phase. And despite that, the document that was published for consultation in, in January is arguably you know, well, in our opinion, it's not a just transition plan, nor does it do enough to uh, meet climate targets for the energy sector. Basically, what it is, is a compilation of existing policy that's pulled together uh, in one place um, with a bit of economic and jobs modelling. And it kind of ducks all the big issues that we really need to be getting to grips with at this point um, in, uh, in the climate catastrophe, essentially. And it opens up the question of oil and gas phase out but it doesn't actually say what the Scottish government would intend to do on that, even though some of the headlines um, around its reporting have implied that it's a foregone conclusion that the Scottish government is uh, going to phase out oil and gas. Um, and frankly, we'd hope to see more uh, clarity and leadership from the Scottish government at this point in time, because there is no real justification for asking the question about oil and gas phase out at this stage. We, we know the answer to that. Uh, the question is really how do we put an end to it, how do we phase it out in a way that doesn't harm communities and workers dependent on the industry for their livelihoods and how do we do it in a way that creates decent green jobs here in Scotland and uh, across um, the UK. In terms of the just transition plan element, it's not really a just transition plan at all, there's a list of just transition outcomes at the end, but no plan to actually make them happen a series of sort of boxes with pull out figures of very speculative uh, jobs figures. Um, so it's really not clear how all this pre engagement has actually shaped the document. Um, and given these headlines about oil and gas phase out that have, that have uh, uh, been published around it, um, there's really nothing in the document to give any comfort to an offshore worker uh, that their livelihoods are being thought of and will be protected. Uh, as a result of this strategy. So there's a, there's a huge amount to fight for in the ESJTP. That consultation process is ongoing until um, early May. And then we understand there is still further opportunity to influence that ahead of uh, its incorporation in the climate change plan towards the, end of, towards the end of the year. So a lot to fight for and even more, to fight for depending on the outcome of the SNP leadership election, which is obviously just throwing up lots of questions um, for those of us campaigning on this and many other issues in Scotland at the moment. If Humza Yousaf wins, he, you know, he's, he's seen as the continuity candidate, so there is scope to secure something stronger that's in, than that is in the current draft. If Kate Forbes wins, we could be in altogether very different uh, territory as she's economically much more neoliberal than the current um, leadership. But I think having said that, what underpins the need for the energy strategy and just transition plan in the first place is this legal requirement to meet our climate targets and to do so by way of a just transition. Um, 
uh, and, and arguably there is therefore only so far that Forbes or anyone else could go in unpicking the, the, the pretty limited ambition of the current draft. So seeking to influence and shape um, the ESJTP and using the R power demands to do so will be a really important piece of our work over the next six months or so. And we're also expecting the publication of outline just transition plans for the transport sector, buildings and construction and land and agriculture in spring. Um, so again, using uh, the work um, around our power as inspiration for bringing together allies to influence these, even if the demands aren't totally um, uh, transferable or relevant to these um, sectors. And actually we're already, you know, many of the demands that the workers came up with as part of this process are things that we're already, they're already reflected in our current campaigning on just energy transition and, and, and they're simply sort of further strengthened um, by this work. So uh, the demands around worker and trade union involvement in process, pathways out of oil and gas to renewables, the removal of, of, of barriers to the same, uh, investment in port infrastructure, public ownership and reorganizing the tax system. These were all things that we've been calling for for some years now. Um, for the Just Transition Partnership, a big focus will be on public ownership. And we just had a, 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 a really um, uh, interesting conference on uh, public ownership uh, in the last week or so. That's available online if anyone's interested in going back and, and, and looking at the discussion um, there. And I think there's this wider um, job to be done of, um, you know, really sharing these demands and this process and bringing them to the wider movement and seeking sort of collaboration or other organizations taking ownership of some of these demands. And, uh, you know, for example, migrant rights organizations, uh, you know, the potential to work together on the universal wage floor demands. So lots of work to be done still in the early stages of, of thinking through exactly what that all looks like beyond um, shaping the energy strategy and just transition plan. I'm going to stop there and I think we can move on time. To the yeah well, <laughs> well done Mary and well done Rosemary that was exactly for time. <laughs>